Good morning, it is I, Chris Abraham, Chris Cast, Season 2, Episode 29. I was a teenage commando. See ya after the message. Good morning, good morning, good morning. My name's Chris Abraham, and I am uh, a podcaster. And this is episode 29 of uh, Chris Cast Season 2. And today's story is about, it's a ramble, it's a rant, it's a, it's a, the, I don't have any notes, so we'll see how well I do. But the title is, I Was a Teenage Commando. So, when I was six, my parents decided to move to Hawaii because of some bad business decisions that my dad made, which coincided with the fact that he didn't want to live in New York City anymore, considering that a few years, a couple years earlier, the family, including me, uh, took a holiday and went to Hawaii. And here comes a garbage truck. Man, the decibels on that thing, decibels, decibels, decibels on that thing is crazy. Anyway, um, so six years old, moved to Hawaii. And I don't know how many of you have been to Hawaii, but it's a pretty locals only kind of uh, kind of uh, kind of state, really locals only kind of state. Uh, they like to have containment for their haoles. And haole is a Hawaiian word meaning... <laughs> meaning um, uh, human without breath. Or, or They thought we were ghosts when they first saw us. So we are spiritless creatures, we howlies. We are soulless creatures. And it then became translated as unwelcome visitors. And now it's just white people. So it wasn't a thing. I, I really... My parents first moved to a uh, 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 garden apartment, kind of rent-controlled kind of uh, apartment area right across from uh, the Salt Lake um, Salt Lake uh, st- uh, Mall, Strip Mall, and um, uh, Salt Lake Shopping Center is what it was called, and then right across the street from Aliamanu Elementary School. So... I was literally one road away from uh, Safeway and one road away from uh, elementary school. So I went to kindergarten and uh, never been a sports kid. Like my dad didn't play any sports. My mom didn't play any sports. My dad didn't watch any sports. So like we didn't, I didn't play any sports. The only thing my dad taught me to do was stuff that he learned uh, being a Marine. He taught me how to how to punch with my elbows, and he taught me that when I, uh, to fall in a tumble. So that's all the sports craft that my dad taught me. He also uh, helped me make um, model, uh, model rockets, and he helped me find um, cardboard boxes so that we could ride cardboard boxes down the side of a grassy slope and he did teach me how to bicycle so that's my sport from my dad bicycling thank you dad i still do it today um and so living in hawaii you know fast forward uh, ali Manu elementary was amazing i fell in love with one girl there her name was melanie sakai when i should have been in love with michelle meow um Melanie, I think, was in love with Paul Young. And so, you know, being a, being a Howley kid was never a benefit in the dating world in Hawaii. You know, sexy and hot is, uh, is race blind. It's still based on the same things like prowess, confidence, handsomeness, 
uh, sports, uh, you know, body, hair, fashion sense, and, um, and, you know, aggressiveness, I guess. Like, not assault, but, you know, willing to go ahead and just be cool, I guess that's it. Anyway, when I was approaching intermediate school, I, I probably would have happily gone to Alimanu Intermediate School, although those kids, man, uh, the girls actually had boobs in intermediate school. I kind of, kind of intimidated me, you know, that was wild, like how older, much older seventh and eighth graders look than, uh, than even sixth graders, because that's when the hormones kick in. So, but it wasn't my choice. My parents upgraded to a condominium downtown. Brand new condo. I thought it was really cool. It was right up against um, Punchbowl National Cemetery. It was on Lusitana Street. And so that required, I can finish the end of sixth grade uh, taking the bus all the way to um, Salt Lake, which is not that far. Um, Really, when I look at it now, I could walk between them. But back then, it was a full-on bus ride. It was the, it was another like zip code. So I took the bus back to school every day. I believe I even had to do a. I believe I had to do a a, uh, a switch, a bus switch. Anyway, so I would have had to have gone to Central. Uh, Central Intermediate Central Intermediate School and I was scared like crazy to go to Central and then Central High School man I don't know man I haven't met anybody who went to Central who like is in my sphere of knowing like it was it was going to look like it was going to look like a tough school to go to for a freaking howley although I mean Central High School was right downtown in downtown Honolulu so like how could it have been but anyway Um, I was intimidated out of it, so I convinced my parents to send me to private school. And over the course of choosing private schools, maybe, maybe my pop-pop said he would pay if I went to a Catholic school. So I don't remember. I remember taking tests and stuff, and I remember getting into St. Louis. And I remember taking tours of Iolani and Punahou, and I remember being told, uh, try again, ninth grade. So I ended up uh, being a uh, seventh grader at St. Louis. And um, I don't think seventh and eighth graders were allowed to join ROTC. I don't remember how it all went, but I think that once we hit ninth grade, we had a lot more choices. And I think those in choices included band, rifle team, um, PE, and uh, ROTC. So I started with rifle team, you know, got pretty good. They had um, bolt action, 22 caliber. I remember pretty good, pretty good target shooting rifles. And I believe that they had peep scopes, if I recall correctly. They were pretty good sets up, setups. Um, but for whatever reason, you know, once we got into ROTC, uh, got into Color Guard, got into Spit and Polish, this uh, this club came around. Uh, Sergeant Major, I just called him Sergeant Major, but he he um, it was either him or maybe it was just cool or try it out or maybe I noticed that every Thursday when or was it Wednesday when everybody had to wear their ROTC uniforms which included you know class A's and uh, patent leather shoes and um, envelope hats I realized that there were and that was despicable right it was so uncool that every Thursday was it you wore um, military wear right with uh with your rank and your envelope hat that you put under your epaulet uh, or in your pocket or whatever when you were indoors or in class and wore your your lid, wore your cover uh, when you're outside, that whole thing. 
patent leather shoes and long pants. Although you could wear long, you had to wear long pants and uh, and Aloha shirts in St. Louis, so it wasn't kind of a shorts place. Anyway, I noticed that other kids were um, were getting to wear combat boots, jump boots, paratrooper boots that they bloused their ugly slacks into, and they got to wear black berets, and they got to wear black uh, cords, um, on their, uh, on their shoulder. And they had, um, red and blue, which was our school colors. They had flashes on that beret and I asked about them and they were the ROTC Rangers. And so I tried out for the ROTC Rangers and became a ROTC Ranger freshman year. And did I do it for one, two or three years? I do not remember, but it was the time of my life. I don't even know why I ended up leaving ROTC Rangers at all, ever. Um, maybe the lore of being a sports kid in wrestling was the thing to do, but man, they literally trained you to be a commando. Like, if I had gone into the military, which I'd never actually intended on doing, m most of my friends that went through uh, the JROTC Ranger Club uh, training uh, ended up becoming JSOC level uh, commandos themselves, right? Uh, Mike uh, is um, is uh, Marine Force Recon, and everybody got their 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 uh, jump wings and all kinds of other stuff. So, if it wasn't for me LARPing, like I don't know, there was a real an intense ethos in my house of being extremely anti-war. To the point where years later, when uh, America invaded uh, Iraq for the first Gulf War, my dad called me from Hawaii saying that if there was going to be a uh, draft, he would help me draft dodge by moving us to uh, French Samoa or French Tahiti um, to avoid the draft for me because he didn't want to see me go to war. So anyway, back to Ranger Club. So... Once you became a bona fide ranger, you were entitled to upgrade from um, from the envelope cover to actually wearing a black beret. And with the black beret, you were able to wear a um, black um, 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 cord on your shoulder. And it was really cool. You know, you uh, got to wear... Um, jump boots that you had to spit polish um, before Thursday and, and during any time at, uh, at, uh, at you know, field exercises. And you, you responded to a different chain of command. Uh, you responded to the um, Ranger commander. And the entire time I remember being in the Rangers, uh, maybe... Maybe I left after Charles Among and Eric O graduated. Did they graduate a year before me or two years before me? Anyway, and then when was wrestling season? I gotta find out. Hey Google. What uh, what what when is uh, high school wrestling season? High school wrestling season customarily runs from October or November to March. So, so that basically means that uh, I must have been seventeen because I wasn't 16. Was I 16 or was I 17? I don't remember. It's not very clear. I need to look in my yearbooks. But um, until I became a wrestler, which was terrible for me because I, well, no, it actually taught me how to run uh, recreationally. But um, man, so Charles Among was my commander. Uh, Eric O was my assistant commander. And those guys, they made a man out of me. They they under their tutelage I dropped you know must have been 50 pounds uh, 30 20 pounds I 
became uh, an amazing uh, battlefield stud. I um, don't even remember what what rank I got to. Was I was I a sergeant? I don't remember. But whatever it was, I I really loved it. And the thing that was crazy about Rangers is that it was a full time job outside of high school, right? Um, so the biggest thing is that we would have all of these, all of these um, uh, field trips, and all these field trips were absolutely uh, don't ask, don't tell. They were a hundred percent. I know what that means, but it was completely. Um, the first rule of uh, ROTC Rangers is that you don't talk about ROTC Rangers. And the, the thing that was really crazy about ROTC Rangers is that we couldn't tell anybody because it was a simple, it was a simple um, field trip. We couldn't tell anybody that what we're actually doing on these field trips were um, running around East Range uh, on Oahu and firing blank adapted M16s and M60s and... Um, uh, fake um, mines, fake claymores, at uh, at 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 Army National Guard, Army Reserve, and we were doing training with uh, uh, Marine Force Recon Reserve, and we were doing we were we were spending our spring breaks at Air Assault School, Air Assault, not not aerosol like as in spray, but Air Assault School. There's an air assault school on Oahu, and we were taught to uh, rappel out of Black Blackhawks, and we took flights in Blackhawks, and we did push-ups on on red logs, and we did ranger down, which is when one person drops for push-ups, everybody drops and push for push-ups when out of solidarity. Um, we would do these amazing um, uh, training missions where we would have to put one of our men into a kit like into a um uh onto a stretcher and we would have to take them you know i don't know how many miles but we would have to bring them back in one piece through ingenuity i assume and team team uh teamsmanship um and then there were those weekends man uh from friday afternoon Three or four o'clock, a giant uh, eggshell white bus would come with the blacked out windows that were common in those days and maybe these days when it comes to moving troops around. Um, uh, and they would pick us up. We would bring our Alice pack full of stuff. We would have, um, we would be fully kitted. Um, I remember admiring. Charlie among because we were non-traditional forces so we didn't we while we were issued battle dress uniforms we were issued BDUs for those weekends um, all of us went to um, the local uh, surplus store in Waikiki and spent hundreds of dollars on getting kitted up with uh, with with stuff like rip stop slant pocketed Vietnam era OD, um, uh, you know, uh, uniforms and uh, uh, tiger stripe, full-on tiger stripe uniforms, and um, some people would even play with uh, with British uniforms and other types of crazy stuff like that. And we would all we all wore boonie caps, which are bush hats, which are basically military style surplus. Um, bucket hats, as you know them, maybe. And we would uh, put, I guess it's blackface, but we'd put camouflage all over our face, little little compact that would we would get at the at the um, at the surplus store with black, green, and brown. Put that all over our face, and we would go stand in line with our berets and our booty caps and our regular caps with cat eyes in the back. You know, the regular kind of 1980s, 1990s version of either the camouflage one or we would get to go with our slant pocket OD fatigues. We'd get the regular build um, army caps and we would have our moms or we would sew uh, little squares of green, um, green uh, 
you know, what is that called? Uh, uh, glow in the dark green cat eyes, which, you know, are used by rangers. Since we thought we were rangers, we wore as close to ranger things so that the cat eyes would let people you know that you were friendly in front of you. This is way before anybody had um, uh, night vision goggles. Man, it was over the top. Uh, I wish I had gotten one of those crazy military haircuts, you know, high, like super high and super tight. But through most of my ROTC days, my hair was regular. Um, what else? Man, I worshipped uh, Charles Among. He was the older brother I never had. I'm an only, an only child. And him and he and Eric O, we would, uh, the weekends we weren't doing... Um, we weren't do so. What we did is we we did what is called op four, and I will tell you all about op four after the message. Welcome back to episode 29 of Chris Cast. I'm talking about I was a teenage commando. Um, so we did this thing called Op 4. And that's what... Uh, that is what the Army calls opposing force. And we started off um, going out and doing these Op 4 uh, campaigns. And they would give us rubber AKs, rubber AK-47s. And they would give us fake Russian papers. And they would make us run around. And the army scouts, who were the reserve uh, scouts, who were all retired. Uh, or, you know, they were um, not retired. They were, they were active combat Vietnam vets, special forces vets and scout vets that were then used as, a, um, as, a, as scout reserve people. And they were so badass. But we'd run around with these really heavy rubber AKs and these uh, Russian um, passports. And we were told to only say our uh, name, rank, and serial number. So in preparation for these opposition force outings to East Range, like I said, uh, Rangers was a full-time job. So every day after school... There was a thing called the back range of our high school, which was undeveloped at that time and was basically all all trees. And um, it was up a hill behind behind the it was behind the tennis courts. It was the closest thing we had to wilderness. And frickin' a Charles Among taught us silent movement. He taught us um, camouflage. He would make us jump up and down and use and, and, you know, make sure that everything was taped down so we wouldn't make any noise. He, he would rigorously run us through PT every day. He would make us uh, do um, both regular runs as well as rucks. And rucks are basically fully in BDU plus boots with a full Alice pack on. He would make us hump. Uh, which is to say, um, uh, go up into that wilderness with our full, full camouflage. So we got used to the weight on us because when we were on East Range, uh, 80% of the time we'd be rucking with our Alice packs. 20% of the time we'd be doing operations and we'd, you know, drop our stuff somewhere, uh, hide it in sort of a bivouac. And, um, is that a right, right word? Anyway, in a little, uh, a little, uh, a little encampment, and then we'd go. Um, uh, he, we would go into the JROTC classrooms, and we'd get the um, overhead projector, and he would 
run us through the identification of friendly versus unfriendly um, military vehicles and air force planes jets helicopters uh, we would have to look at the profiles of an Abrams tank versus a Russian tank. Uh, at that point, there were only Jeeps. There were no uh, Humvees at all in 1984, 85, 86, 87. Um, so I, uh, so we'd, oh, uh, he would uh, make us buy the uh, Ranger guy, the Ranger manual which is, you know, an official ranger guide to teach you um, every operational skill that a ranger is required. And he would also give us, you know, all the other type of ranger guides, um, uh, air assault guides. Like, you can find them on Amazon. They're all there. They teach you how to uh, improvise explosives. They teach you how to, how to do L ambushes. They tell you how to do... How to, how to move troops, they tell you um, what kind of training you need to do, what kind of PT you need to do, uh, the expectations for run speeds. Like we basically read that as our, as our toilet literature. We were so committed because we knew every weekend uh, we would be going out into the bush and eventually we were given real AR, we, M16s, we were given real a, M16s with full auto, semi-auto, and safe, full auto M16s. And since I was the biggest guy, I was six foot two, six foot three, I, it was my responsibility to be the pig man. So I was literally at 15, 16 years old, issued an M60A1 machine gun and given uh, an assistant gunner who would carry um, asbestos mitts and extra barrels and we would run around with huge bandoliers of extra 7.62 uh, ammunition. That was why they said they called me. My nickname in ROTC was Duga. And they say that was because my M60, unlike the pap, 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 pap of the M16s, which I never got to really carry. I did a bunch, but... Um, My 7.62 NATO rounds went duga 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 more like dump 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 dump. Um, so they called me duga, but I think they called me duga because I was a duga. I was a totally du I was a total dug. They called me Abe, called me Ab Baby. Ab Baby was my nickname. Um, uh, um, Brosif because Abraham, you know, Broham. Um, nobody called anybody by their first names. It was always among and O oh, and, uh, you know, court, but you know, um, it was really good. It was so, so nice to have a family of, uh, of cool dudes. Uh, and it was our secret, right? It was totally our secret. If any of the parents ever knew that we were out on East range, I mean, they should have known something because, we would literally be awake all weekend long from Friday night until we probably we'd sleep well Friday night. Friday night we would generally be at um, uh, we'd Jeff generally be set up at an encampment or in uh, dormitories, and then first thing first light of Saturday. We would be up until Sunday afternoon. Uh, maybe we did it Saturday night, but I don't think that uh, most of the uh, National Guard people who are being trained would be available or up or accessible at that time. So we would, our job was to disrupt uh, supply chain. That was our 100% job. Uh, while all of our M16s and M60s had blank adapters, we did not use mile systems, so it was not about um, beep, 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 beep. It was not a laser system where you, it's, it wasn't laser tag. There's a, there's a, there's a, a form of laser tag that, that the military does in order to see who dies and, and so forth. But the thing is, is that uh, that's not 
that wasn't the thing that we normally do. Um, we did that a bunch of times, but what, what we really did more often than not was we just used the blank adapters and we used our, our M16s and M60s and our, um, our bang, uh, bang grenades, not, you know, our Mick, our, 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 our fake Claymore mines to really, to F with, uh, the, uh, National Guard and uh, Army Reserve guys, because they, most of their jobs, like, we, there was no way that we were really, every time we went up against um, uh, the Scouts or the uh, Marine Reserves or anything like that, they, they, like, pawned us, they pwned us every single bloody time before we knew what was going on. They had us in chairs, they had us riot cuffed into chairs, they were interrogating us, they were making us pee our pants, they were making us um, cry daddy, they were, it was really brutal, like some of those, I got caught once by a scout and he brought me in there and he literally put his his boot into my chest and kicked my chair over. Um, I thought I had done really well, but apparently because I'm uh, plausible, deniable, and because I wasn't, because I was supposed to be an insurgency team, a teenage insurgency team, I wasn't even supposed to even say that I had a name, rank, or serial number. So I failed. I should have just kept my mouth shut, shut but um, it was so cool, man. I mean, to walk around as a 16-year-old with an M60A1 uh, is just freaking crazy. That That's the uh, machine gun to put a picture in your head. That's the machine gun that... Um, that uh, Rambo is pictured with, you know, where he's holding it all by himself. Um, that is not how I should have had pictures taken. You know, there aren't any pictures of us doing this because it was so verboten. We were so not allowed to do that kind of thing for fear that the, I mean, our Sergeant Major was, had told us that if we, you know, um, uh, um, that <laughs> that uh, snitches make you know stitches snitches get stitches, and that if any of our moms knew that when they signed our uh, release form to go to uh, a ROTC uh, field trip, we were actually using uh, lethal weapons to, and uh, and putting ourselves in in extreme peril. Uh, when you when you sleep deprive a bunch of adults by going ahead and sneaking around at from zero dark 30 until uh daybreak you know going ahead and doing um doing assaults on their on where they sleep and and uh doing l ambushes on two and a half ton tr trucks uh when these um soldiers are trying to get back from training and they're tired and they want to go back to the barracks and you're going ahead and starting assaults on them and they've got to leave the leave the truck and they've got to defend themselves and they've got to protect themselves and one time um the two and a half ton truck uh rolled off of the uh rolled off into a ditch and i believe that someone was superficially injured and uh but that's just you know that's just the way it was um uh, one of the best memories I remember was training with the Force Recon Reserves, which is the, a special operations force of the Navy. And they're stationed on Oahu, and we got to work with them. And to, to make a comparison, most of the... Um, let me take a break. Oh, thank you. To the force recon uh, reserve guys um 
So, like, the the National Guard and the and the reserves, man, they were pretty casual. They were not uh, true believers. They had um, it was a time of peace ever since seventy five. There was no war. It was pretty safe time. Um, so they uh, they had it pretty well. Like they're paying. It was paying for school. It was subsidizing their income. Um, they were being patriots and, you know, and it's expensive to live in Hawaii. So everybody signs on and people would smoke pot and they would, you know, they would fuck around and they would mess around and they would hang out with us. And so esprit de corps was pretty low and people were joking. And, um, and I know that some of our Rangers would smoke pot with the, uh, with the reservists and the National Guard guys, and some of them even knew each other. Sometimes were out there, and they, the guys saw their uncles and their like you know older brothers and stuff like that. So it was really casual, but not with the Force Recon Reserve guys. Man, they exp- they, they they thought we were terrible. They thought we had the t- most terrible esprit de corps. They thought we were casual. They thought we didn't have any. Um, Oh, what is the term? Esprit de corps. They didn't believe that we had any 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 pride in how we dressed, how we acted. They thought that we, how dare we? Were we're good Catholic boys, and we had uh, we had dirty mouths on us, and we we cursed and and um, and talked shit and and BSed, and they wanted they were either having us on or they were expecting a higher level of discipline. And it was awesome. We got to do beach training. And since I was the only person, the entire Rangers, who was a dive master, I was the queen of the ball. Um, I knew how to scuba dive. I was a fierce swimmer. And our training was amazing. We'd go out in, uh, in, in inflatables like you see in like the, you know, the freaking Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine videos. You go into Zodiacs and inflatables. You're taught how to, how to, uh, come into a beach, how to, uh, when you come in, uh, with your inflatables. Oh, come on. When you come in with your inflatables, uh, by dark of night in your, in your BDUs, um, you, uh, leave everybody oh come on brother jeez what are you crazy what are you doing brother uh bdus go really dark when they're wet right so what you need to do is you do a triangulation of the shore but you can't do that unless you have someone with uh with um flashlights from the shore to help you go in so what each boat would, each inflatable would do is find the strongest swimmer to go under, to, to, to kick in, in the BDUs. And uh, while going in, you do a full reconnaissance of the water going in to make sure that there's no mines or people or punjis or, or barriers or, or blockades or anything like that. You completely sweep um, the shoreline as the scout, and then you, uh, you low crawl up onto the beach. And the moment you reach the waterline, you roll in the sand to cover your black, dark BDUs with sand. And then you low crawl up to the, to the tree line or to the brush line. And at that point, you take out your waterproof light. At that point, it was like one of those L, those L flashlights, those uh, surplus L flashlights that you know you can either use with red light or with with uh, with with white light. And they were incandescent bulbs, not LEDs. And then you and your other guy uh, up on the shoreline, about you know a hundred yards apart, can um, signal in your uh, assault team in uh, your your uh, force recon uh, beach assault team, and they can triangulate where they are based on the lights that you, who've uh, single-handedly, as point man scout. Uh, um, so you did a first sweep, 
you made sure that the shoreline was safe by offering yourself up to a hail of bullets and then you can make it easier for that assault team to come in um, using the triangulation, the two points of, uh, of your lamps on the, uh, from, from, uh, the, from the cover of the uh, tree line. So that's what we did over and over. We practiced rolling in sand. We practiced high and low um, um, inflatables carry. We practiced, all of us got to practice things like uh, under, like survival uh, by taking off your BDUs, cinching, uh, using the cinches uh, at the uh, at the um, at the cuffs of your BDUs, and um, cinching your BDUs as a flotation device, um, all kinds of cool stuff. That was definitely the coolest training session that we got to spend an entire weekend being berated by what garbage people we were by the uh, Force Recon Marines, and my dad was a Marine. So I know that esprit de corps is hugely important and uh, pride in body, self, uh, appearance, and behavior. Um, but I never thought it was actually true. And maybe they were taking the piss out of us. I'll ask uh, one of my uh, ROTC brothers ended up uh, becoming a Force Recon Marine himself. So I should ask him whether they were taking the piss or whether there is uh, higher standards in the Corps. Anyway... Last break and then uh, a goodbye and we'll talk to you soon. Hey there, um, my name is Chris Abraham. This is episode 28 of Chris Cast. My name is Chris Abraham, and now we're saying goodbye. Uh, and um, uh, and it's going to be sad to say goodbye. I don't know what I missed. Uh, next time I talk about this, I will include more names. I just included Charles Among and Eric O and Peter Court. But aside from that, there were a lot of cool people. Um, anyway, my name's Chris Abraham. I'm Chris at Abraham.su. Uh, you can reach me at plus one, two Oh two, three, five, two, five, zero, five, one, uh, via WhatsApp or text. You can re call me at two Oh two, three, five, two, five, zero, five, one. But if I don't recognize your number, please leave a message because otherwise I won't return your call and I'll ignore it. And if you don't leave a message, I'll even block your number. Um, what else? Uh, ChrisAbraham.com is my HQ. Anchor.fm slash ChrisAbraham is my podcast HQ. If you search one word, C-H-R-I-S-C-A-S-T, anywhere on Google or Bing, you'll be able to find me, though there's another Chris Spacecast. Um, I'm at ChrisAbraham on Twitter, at ChrisAbraham on Instagram. I am LinkedIn.com slash in slash ChrisAbraham. I am uh, YouTube.com slash Chris Abraham. Um, I am at Chris at No Agenda Social. And I think that might be it. Am I missing one? Anyway, love you guys. Talk to you soon. Mahalo. Aloha. Nui loa. Ciao. Auf Wiedersehen. Uh, abiento.